Lord Heavenly Father, we want to just pray for this morning that we look at your word, we look at ourselves, but more importantly, we look at you and we hear you. Pray for this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, proper good morning to you all. Good morning. I uh, just want to say, uh, if you remember last week, I mentioned the fact that the leadership team and staff team uh, took a day away yesterday to uh, look at vision and stuff for God. I'm not going to talk about what happened yesterday, but just needed to say it was a significant day. And uh, as time goes on, uh, we will start sort of giving back to you from what we believe we heard from God. So just thank you for your prayers. So what did we learn last week? Can we remember? Can anybody at all remember what we learned last week because you're worth it thank you Graham do you remember that because you're worth it good excellent we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 to 16 and it was looking at clothing headwear you know whatever else and the key message behind it was as it has been throughout the whole, really, of 1 Corinthians, is it's not about you, but it's about who's in the room with you. Exactly. It's never about us. It's always about who's in the room with us. So there was that appropriate clothing, so not to distract the other. You know, remember, hair back then was seen as a sexual item on women. Long, lovely hair. Men would get aroused by that, so that's why the women should wear a head covering. It's also about honouring the man in the house and honouring your husband and also being honourable to your fellow brother and sister in Christ. And also there was a part of us looking at appreciating the otherness in the other person. I mean, look at us. We're all a diverse bunch, aren't we? Not one of us is the same. Isn't that amazing? It's good. There's only one of me. That's enough for the world. But none of us are the same. So we're all very different. And we're all called to be brothers and sisters in Christ and share in that one body, that one unity of who Jesus is. But if we're honest, the whole bunch of us probably wouldn't know each other if it wasn't for Jesus. We don't quite have all the same interests and hobbies and whatever else. So we all have to get along. Doesn't mean you're going to be the best bud with everybody in the room, but we have to appreciate the otherness in the other person. And I think if I remember correctly, part of that was sort of, you know, sometimes we may have to adjust our slight behavior because of the other person in the room. So if you know you're talking to somebody who's fairly sensitive, you're not meant to be an overbearing oaf, are you? Don't just exert your way of being. And also, if you're somebody slightly oversensitive, maybe you need to just think about your reactions. It's about appreciating we're not all the same. So we're going to carry on now with the rest of chapter 11. We are going to finish this today. And it's probably 17 to verse 34. And it's probably the one that we know one of the best passages. Yeah? Yeah? Because we quote from it so often, it's quoted normally on the first Sunday every month, the third Sunday of every month, and normally the fifth Sunday of every month. Do you know which bit it is? Loudly. The Lord's Supper. It's the communion bit. And we always quote sort of roughly from about verse 23 through to 26. And you'll know that so well. But what we sort of miss is the bits either side, because they make really uncomfortable reading. Really uncomfortable. And I want to turn around to you and say, and now I'm going to unpack it and make you feel so much more comfortable about those uncomfortable bits, okay? Would you like that? You can't have it, because it doesn't exist. There are two verses in that whole section where it is comfortable, and we'll come to those at some point, but the rest of it makes uncomfortable reading, because we do believe in an all-loving God 
who loves us dearly. Amen? You believe and you feel loved by God. Amen? But he's also this same loving God who's a God of love of justice. He's a God of discipline because he's our loving father. And any good parent will discipline their child because they want to bring you up in the love and lifestyle. That does involve discipline. So we do have a God who doesn't just say, it's okay, do whatever you want, I'm going to love you. There are some disciplinary points. And for the whole of 1 Corinthians, Paul has been pointing out to the Corinthian church, and especially certain members of the church, where they have been really out of order. And this is one of those moments. So at the beginning of chapter 11, he praised them for following his teachings. And the, the, Remember the word, the dirty word, tradition, that isn't a dirty word? How they've been following some of the traditions that he's been laying down. But now he kicks off. So you ready? Verse 17 to 22. But... Oh, I don't know about you, but when there's a but in Paul's writing, I don't like it. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you. For it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And to some extent, I believe it. But of course there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I most supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. Ooh. Now, Paul, in his writing, if you read it correctly, and if the interpreters do it right, there is element of sarcasm, deliberate, embarrassing sarcasm, not humorous sarcasm. It's real sarcasm to shake you up. And I'd say to you that a chunk of some of what we've just read is sarcasm to shake up some of the members of the church. First and foremost, we have communion here, don't we? And it's on from this table normally, yes? And it's a loaf of bread and what I like to consider to be little glasses. Sometimes I do call them the shot glasses. I can't help it. That's what they look like. But little glasses of juice, okay? And there's reasons we do juice and that's for various other reasons but to appreciate the others who are in the room with us. That's why we do juice. And we break the bread and we take our bits of bread and then we come and take, uh, get our, our little glasses and we drink as one body. All very symbolic, a spiritual reality to it, and I absolutely agree with it. So I'm not being flippant about it. It's absolutely right. But what really happened when they celebrated the Lord's Supper, because it was a takeover from the Passover meal, it's all done around an actual real meal. Real food, a real dinner. Who was here at the Maundy Thursday service? Was anybody here when I did the Maundy Thursday evening? Yeah, some of you. Great. What did we eat? Did we just have bread and just a little bit of juice? Can... The lamb thing on the, the, the spiky thing. Yep, we had lamb meat. Yeah, doner kebab meat, you know, just to play it safe because it was the cheaper to get it like that. That's it. We had doner kebab meat. And we had uh, rolls of bread as well because I decided to make it like it really was, an actual meal. Now, they would have had more than that. It would have been a proper meal. So what would have happened is they would have broke bread, then had their meal, and then drunk the wine. They would have been drinking the wine through the meal as well, by the way. But the 
particular cup was a significant sort of, as Jesus said, you know, this is the blood of my covenant, uh, the new covenant in a special cup. And they would have done that. I don't think it was a special cup, but it was the cup they would have said, okay, this is now this moment we're signifying. So it was done over a meal. So it's completely different from how we do communion today. Second of all, when you're talking about a church, what do you think of? A building like this, and then us. I mean, actually, it's the people who are the church, by the way. We're actually the bride of Christ. But so we tend to think where we meet, etc., it's a nice church. Big building that we signify as the church. Back then, they didn't have these. Did you know that? There weren't bells on top of spires ding-donging. Actually, we, where we were for our day away, there was a church in the village there that actually had its bell going off at the hour. It was lovely to hear. But they didn't have that then. No, where they met was probably, especially in Corinth here, they would have met in one of the richer members of the church house, which would have been more nearer like a Roman villa. Now, I wanted to put the picture up. God bless modern technology. So I'm going to try and describe it to you, and we'll get that in a minute, okay? But bizarrely enough, we've almost got a layout here. And we'll come to that in a moment, a bit later on. So it was actually somebody's home to which they were eating in. Now, please don't sort of get the idea of a, you know, front room, three bedrooms upstairs and a toilet. You know, it was a big place. It was one of the richer people. So think large, spooling sort of, well, basically, imagine this flooring at the moment. Look around the floor. Don't look at me. Look around at this. Imagine you've come in through the main entrance, which is where Andy is sitting now. I'll stare at him because he's not concentrating on me. He's concentrating on what he's writing. So I'll stare at Andy. I know, I know you are a joke. But imagine the sprawling door is all the way back here. And this is the first section you walk into, and it's the atrium. And it's probably water here, and it looks like a fountainy type thing. Okay, imagine that. So you walk in, so you've got that area. Then you've sort of got a bit of a... Oh, what used to be a bit of a partition, but not much, that would take you into the next section. And here, all of you that's under what I call the veranda bit, the new section, yeah? Imagine that as the uh, triclonium, okay? I think that's how you pronounce it. But where you could seat about 9 to 12 people for dinner, okay? So if you're under there, later on I'll tell you how privileged you are. So imagine that, and then you've got the rest of this area here, which is sort of a meeting area and a lounge area. And here at the back, tucked away out the way, round the corner, nobody can see you, is the kitchen, where all the cooking is done. I don't belong in there ever, because I don't do any cooking. But you've got the point of a Roman villa. This sort of size, okay? Not quite as big, but you know, a decent size. And it could cater up to about 50 people. That's around the fountain. I wonder if they ever baptised in that. So you're with me so far on the Roman villa. So that's where they met for church. So we have to bear that in mind. So what has happened here? Well, there appears to be divisions among them. When it comes down to meeting for the Lord's Supper. Now, we don't know if they did it on the first Sunday, the third Sunday, and the fifth Sunday of every month. Nobody got that joke, no? Okay. In this, in the Baptist, it's always used to be the first Sunday in the morning and the third Sunday in the evening. That's when you had communion. Well, we don't have really evening services, so we put it to the third Sunday in the morning. And any other time we feel like it. Because we actually hold it in incredibly high regard. Okay. So, just to give you that. So they would meet, and when they're coming to meet for the Lord's Supper, they would uh, uh, do that in a way that would, is meant to be honouring to God. But clearly there is some divisions here. Well, we know the whole of the letter is about there being divisions. And Paul has said, I've heard there is some divisions among you. And the reason for the divisions is actually based on social status. And we'll come to what that means in a moment. 
And Paul says this strange word in verse 17. Um, no, sorry, 18. And to some extent, I believe it. What was he talking about? Why is it to some extent I believe I've heard correctly there are divisions? Well, I think there's a partly an element of sarcasm, but I also think he's saying, this is what I've heard. I believe it to some extent, but I don't think I'm hearing the whole story. But nonetheless, he considered this to be what he's heard important enough to tackle now in a letter. And what's going on? Well, there must be divisions among you so that you will have God's approval and it will be recognized. It would appear that the social elite, maybe the wealthier of the church, are doing something that says, well, you know, we're approved by God because we've got all this wealth. Or they're saying, well, clearly we need to do something different from the rest of the church because we have God's approval. It clearly shows that we have God's approval. And Paul is starting to sort of attack that and saying, really? I will just say that... um, There are divisions in churches, and it's not always based on argument. There's always divisions in gathered church. And it is actually the division between those who believe in Jesus and have committed their life to him fully, and those who haven't. Equally belong in the church gathering. Equally are loved by God. So hear me carefully, this is not some accusational thing. But there is always that clear dividing line. We in the Baptists also do it sort of by membership as well, but I'm not going into that. It's about the kingdom of God. So actually, funnily enough, some of these Corinthians could be saying, oh, but some of us have got God's approval. We're recognized by God as full-on born-again Christians. And Paul could say, well, you're right. And there is sometimes divisions within church. And actually, there is Christ's judgment coming, is there not? And there is a time when actually we will be separated from those who have come to know Jesus and those who haven't. I know we're falling into this wonderful, all-loving world idea now, and I'm hearing it around other places, that this all-loving God is going to just welcome everybody in, no matter what. I don't see that in the Bible. I don't know which one they're reading, but it's not the one I've got. So one element, there is divisions, and I don't like the word divisions, but do you understand what I mean? And that's why we always go on about here, please accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Doesn't mean anybody loves anybody any less, but accept him as your Lord and Saviour. So what's the problem? What's the problem here? Because it's not that problem. Well, the rich. The rich a lot within the church, and they are seriously rich, by the way. It's not like lower class, middle class, and the super rich, which we would explain here. These guys are under the class of the super rich, okay? And what happens is they don't need to work hard labor, do they? They're part of the church. They don't need to work hard labor. So what appears to be happening is is that um, because they don't need to work, they start having their meal a little bit earlier than everybody else. So they meet, guess where? Over here! So that means you're the super rich. Guess what that means? This is all about you. Start feeling uncomfortable. Right. Joke, clearly. But they were meeting what I would consider, and it's got a nice posh word, but let's call it the special dining room. For the special people. Those in the... I don't mean it. Those in the social special pecking order who sociably are rich. The society was all about honour. And even where you sat 
in the little you circle, well, it wasn't sat, it was laying on the floor and laying against each other, but I'm not going to go into all of that. But where you sat on the table determined your social pecking order. So you're the head of the table, you're right in the middle. You're it, you're the rich one, you're the one that everybody wants to get alongside and cuddle up to and go, hi, want to be my friend? Yeah? Pat's now traumatised, it's okay, Pat. You want me to do that again? Okay. Ah, right. But it's the super rich that the people want to uh, 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 sort of tag alongside because they're going to help their social status. They're going to help their business status. They're going to look like they're more honoured. And the further away you were from the super rich person, the slightly further down you were in the honour system, in the social pecking order. So here's Pat, and if you're all the way over there, you're less than Pat. But Pat's not under there, so Pat's not included in this, okay? But you get the point. But nonetheless, only those who didn't need to work would get there early for church, break the bread, and then start eating all the choice food. Because that's what happened. You got the decent food. Funnily enough, it also would work that the head of the table would get the most and the best. And even down in the mix of nine to 12 people, the further you got down the rack of the table, the less and less food they got. Okay? But they still ate really well. You're with me so far. So what would happen, of course, the elite didn't need to work, so they would just turn up and get on with it. By the time the rest of the church turned up, who were actually the ones that were workers, and actually needed to go to work, would, of course, turn up later on. But they couldn't go in the nice dining room. They'll hang around out here. In the atrium bit. And they may or may not get given any dinner. Do you understand? Because it's whatever's left. And what was also happening was the super rich were drinking. And the point that Paul is making is, but hang on a minute, this meal is about unifying you as one body. You remember the one loaf? We drink together as one body. We're one body in Christ. Amen. Well, he's saying this Lord's Supper, this food you're meant to be eating, which was the whole lot, wasn't just the bread and the wine, it was the meal as well. The whole thing was the Lord's Supper. It was meant to be unifying. Well, if you're scoffing your fat faces and drinking alcohol until you're drunk, and you're not letting the rest of your church actually eat the food, how is that unifying? Okay? And that's Paul's point. You with me so far? Feeling uncomfortable? Especially you lot under the eight. No. So what Paul is saying here is that you, where he says, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. He is talking to the rich lot, the elite, not to the economically poor. By the way, can I just say something? Sometimes also in the Bible, when it actually talks about poor, it doesn't always mean the economically poor. Sometimes it's about genuinely the poor in spirit. Not always. Hear me carefully. You, you, you don't just suddenly read one thing where it clearly is talking about looking after the economically poor. And you're going, ah, oh, Pastor Warren said I can ignore that. That's not what that means. That's not what I'm saying. You just have to be careful in, in, in the right. But in this particular case, it is talking the economically poor of the church. It's the problem with the English language. It has one word that can have multiple meanings. So what Paul is saying here is by doing what you're doing, you're so hurried, you're hurriedly eating your own meal that some are going hungry while you're getting drunk. 
And he's saying, you're actually, or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? By doing what you're doing, you're shaming the poor of the church. They're already feeling economically low. They're turning up. Think about this for a minute. See if we can put them in our shoes. Uh, We in the West, whether you are earning a wage working, um, it's tight on the line, or you're on benefits, you are actually rich compared to the rest of the world. Let's make that very clear. But imagine just for a moment yourself, and I don't believe anybody here lives in a particular mansion. Anybody? Anyone put their hand in the air? Like Like a proper... Do you? Timmy, do you want to see Doral later? She lives in a mansion, so this is fine. But imagine just for a minute, you've been invited to some super rich person's house. Just imagine for a minute, and the whole place is marbled floor, marbled pillars, gold leaf inlay on the end of the finials and all that sort of thing. Could you, could you imagine that for a minute? And you've been invited for a meal, along with 49 other people. Yeah, you with me so far? Okay. And they said, come along. It starts at two. But come along at any time, because we recognize that not everybody can turn up on time. Problem is, you're working. And you can't get there until you finish work at five o'clock. But they know that, the people that invited you, because you've told them. But you know you're going to turn up in this really posh place with those that are really famous in society. How do you feel right now? Now, if we're honest, and if I'm honest, I know that I would turn up with a sense of, I am not, don't think I can enter into here. I am not worthy. I am less than they are because I am not as rich or I'm not on the social order, yeah? So you turn up with that sort of, you see the doors, the looming doors, and you're thinking, oh my goodness me. And you ring the doorbell, and it goes, ding dong. No, it doesn't, it goes, but you turn up at the doors. And you walk in, and nobody's there particularly to welcome you other than people who are in the same status as you. The super rich don't want to welcome you because the person who's invited you is already eating and drinking. You feel less than as by the time you've arrived. And then you turn up thinking, oh, I'm hungry. I can't wait to share a meal with them. And there's nothing. Because they've decided to eat way before you. And they've gone, oh, well, you should have turned up on time. How would you feel? Shamed? Would you like to leave? Run away? Yeah? I know I would. There you go. This is what Paul is saying here. This is how you are making them feel. Yet you're meant to be one church together. So the rich were effectively abusing the poor, abusing them. There was an emotional, mental, and spiritual abuse upon them by doing what they were doing. And of course, Paul is saying, I'm not going to praise you for this. Don't be daft. So what's our equivalent today? Because we make the joke. What's the equivalent in Greenford Baptist Church today? Because we're in a different, different social setup. We don't have a meal at communion time, do we? Don't forget at the moment, this is just focused on that one meeting over communion, over having a meal. We do live in a society with totally different setups. We're meant to be having these things called benefits. I'm the right, anyway. Which are funded by taxpayers. Wouldn't have happened in this time. There was no such thing as social benefits or anything of that nature. No such thing as the NHS. I can only put it into our context where we're living here today, but other countries don't have what we have here. So 
So therefore then there's not that sense that, so when these people turned up back in Corinth, they had nothing. They didn't get to eat unless it was that one meal that week. And there are some in this country today who do not get to eat unless there were food banks. And we shouldn't be in that state at all. I'm going to stop because I'm going to really rant on in a minute and that's not helpful. So I just want to, why we're now unpacking the rest of this, think, well, okay, what can we take from this that will apply to us here today in Greenford Baptist Church? Okay. So Paul, in his embarrassment, in his embarrassing question, was saying, well, can't you rich go home and eat your own food? The funny thing was, they're already in their own home. To get the point, you're already there. Well, why don't you just eat a little bit, a bit earlier on, and then have more cooked up, basically, and then dish that out. So he's saying, stop disgracing God's church because they were disgracing God's church as well by their actions problem is what you've got to remember by the way that the, the, the rich in Corinth actually didn't know really what they were doing particularly wrong probably because it was part of the social culture so they didn't quite see what they were doing was actually was wrong so Paul is challenging their thinking So this, once you've unpacked that and realised that what Paul is saying is, you have done wrong, I'm now going to show you what the Lord's Supper is about, and then hopefully you'll understand, for want of a better phrasing, theologically, why you're doing what is wrong. All right? And this is when we come into this bit we know so well. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread... And gave thanks to God for it. Hold that thinking. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper. Notice that? After supper. We sort of skip over that a little bit sometimes. We sort of miss those two little words. After supper, saying... This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of singing, sinning, against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honouring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by God, sorry, by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. The reason I went through a whole load of that, because I said to you, some of those verses we know inside and out, do we not? Now, it's an interesting phrase here, for I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. Paul never actually met Jesus. Not the human Jesus. He met the risen Jesus, the ascended Jesus, on the road to Damascus, didn't he? And we know how that story went. And it was only a few words that Jesus said to him. So he didn't sit there giving him long-winded instructions about how he was meant to perform communion correctly in church. What does he mean? Well, earlier on, he talked about traditions. He probably got taught... Well, he knew about Passover. He's Jewish. Communion is ultimately the Passover meal, that whole celebration of how um, God released the Israelites from Egypt through Moses and how they passed into the new life. Okay? And the new covenant with the Lord. 
So he understood the elements of that. And probably the disciples taught him how Jesus changed the meaning of that at the time of the Last Supper, yes? So he's got that bit. So what he probably means here is, when he means the Lord, he means what the Lord has sort of may have shown him in the spirit as well, might have unpacked with him theologically, because you don't park your brain when you're discussing things with God. So the combination of the two things means he can get away with saying, this is what I've heard from the Lord. Or he might have had a complete revelation from God at that point. But we reckon it's more that combination of his own theology that he understood, his own understanding of the Passover, what he'd learned from the disciples, uh, the apostles that spent time with Jesus. Do you understand? And so it emphasizes something as well, because he's saying, this has come from the Lord. This is not from me, Paul. So it's given a bit of extra authority to what he's telling them. And also, I want you to note this. He says, on the night when he was betrayed. The Corinthian church did not need to know when the Last Supper took place and when this meal. They already knew that. They don't need reminding that it was a point of when Judas betrayed Jesus. They actually don't need reminding of that. Like we don't need reminding, do we? We know that Judas betrayed Jesus. Yes? Morning, I know it's really humid. Bear with me. But the reason he is saying betrayed is he's emphasizing something to the rich that they are doing to the poor in the church. You are portraying the poor. You are portraying those of Jesus' body. You are portraying your fellow brothers and sisters by what you are doing. That's the descriptive word that he is using. He's really punching something home. Really comfortable, isn't it? That's why he uses that word. So the reason he then goes re-through this again was because he's saying, you are here because of what Jesus did. Body broken for you. New covenant. He gave himself up for you. He sacrificed himself for you. You should be doing the same. You with me? And Paul's really hammering this. And as uh, one uh, scholar wrote, Sam, uh, any behavior that would marginalize members of the community or treat them as lesser than members of the body must be strictly avoided. And Paul is really hammering at home. He's actually almost making wanting to feel guilty. If you remember, he's saying that you are not interested in the Lord's Supper. When you come to meet together, you clearly aren't interested in the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper is about all-inclusiveness, unifying, being together. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. As he says in verse 26, which we'll get there in a minute. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Every time you do this, you're doing... You're remembering why you're doing this. You're remembering what Jesus did for you. So therefore then, if you're doing that, you've got to remember, and it's not just a nice memory, this is what my Lord Jesus did. It's a memory of, well, then how does that apply to me today then? What does it mean about my behavior? I've got to think about others. Jesus thought about others. He thought about everybody here. Not quite literally, by the way, but you know what I mean. He thought about humanity when he came down. When we have this communion, I don't know how you feel. It, it says the words on here, do this in remembrance of me. 
Have you ever read it before? It's normally covered up, actually, with the cloth. I've just had a thought. Anyway, next week, let's not have the cloth. This, do in remembrance of me. Not just remembering Jesus and saying, thank you, Lord. Remembering that our Lord stepped out of heaven and actually became nothing so that you and I could become something. We could become a child of God. He stepped out, thought of not himself, but thought of us. Us. Didn't think of of me above all, as one particular song that we sing sometimes here is. He thought of us. He loved us so much that he stepped out of heaven for the other. And so our job is to do exactly that as well. Yes? It is our job to actually think of the other. And the rich back in Corinth weren't doing that. They were still thinking of me. What they should have probably been doing, and there's an argument here, they either should have been trying to eat the same sort of food that the poorer church were eating, or they should have been giving their food, their rich choice food, to the poorer members of the church. Now, you can make up your mind whichever way you want it to be. But either way, the rich were meant to go, nope, because they even, ready for this, they were being served the food by the servants of their house and the slaves of their house. They would have been members of the church. So what that, the equivalent of that is, is funny enough, is sitting here, say us the leadership team, just to give you a sort of a slight, slight equivalent. By the way, the rich doesn't always mean they were the leaders of the church, okay? Let's just bear that in mind. But just take that. That would be like us leaders sitting around a table and saying, come on in, serve me my dinner. Oh, there's a shock. We're not moving from this place. You come and serve us. And then when you finish serving us our dinner, you go do the clearing up and the washing up, and then you can eventually come and join in the service and then have your own food. Do you see the equivalent? Church lunches here are not the same thing. So that's why I think the ones who do the serving at church lunches are the most honoured. We should thank them a lot as we go around because they actually are waiting for us. Isn't that marvellous? So that's why they shouldn't do the clearing up afterwards. That should be somebody else's job. Just leave that there. Because this whole thing with communion is actually about us being a unifying body and thinking about each other. The social status was marking a distinct difference in Corinth. And what is our equivalent today? Would it be so easy for us to say, oh, well, there's the wealthier of the church, and then there's us. Too much of an easy distinction today. I think there are other distinctions we can make. Because the issue was that for the richer people, they were saying, you're not worthy enough to come into our little dining room. You're not important enough to me. The same can happen in any church. And it's not that it's the rich or the leaders or whatever else, but we can have our own social little cliques. Ah, you're from the same background as me. Welcome. Oh, you're not. And it works both ways. The haves and the have-nots. That works as well. It's like many, 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 many years ago, when quite rightly there was tackling of racism, where normally it was, it was perceived as one colour against another, what kept getting forgetting was racism works both ways. Racism works both ways. Social cliques work both ways. The haves and the have-nots. The haves might say, I don't want the have-nots to be anywhere near me, but the have-nots also say to the haves, I don't want you anywhere near me neither. And the only reason the have-nots don't like the haves is because the haves are haves. Do you see the point? Because they have, and they don't like it, and they're jealous. So they don't want the haves to be anywhere near them. It works both ways. I think we forget this sometimes. 
Jesus came down to break all of those barriers. So they shouldn't exist in a church at all. Shouldn't exist. So what happens when you come to communion? Do you come to communion recognizing that you are taking bread that is part of one body and that you are part of one body? It's not just about you, but it's about everybody else in the room. The rich in Corinth were not honoring the body of Christ. because they were trouncing on the poor a lot. They had a bad attitude towards them. So they weren't eating the Lord's Supper. They were just eating, gorging, gluttonly. When we come to eat the Lord's Supper, when we come here to eat communion, we're not just saying strength just for me, please, Lord. We're saying, I want to honor the body of Christ, i.e. us. Put your hand in the air if you're present. Are you here? You're the body of Christ. So when you're eating this food, you're not just eating the body of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, you know, that element and spirituality of that. You're also honoring and eating part of each other. There's a thought you probably didn't need, but do you understand the point? You're actually coming here and actually honoring each other. And if you do this within a sneering attitude towards somebody else in the room, then you're not honoring the body of Christ. If you're eating it in an unworthy manner, you've got a bad attitude to somebody else in the room, you're not doing it in a worthy manner. This is where it does really get very uncomfortable. Because we talk about examining ourselves. Verse 28, that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. This is where the problem lies. Most people, and I've had this a number of occasions, where people say, well, I've done something bad this week. I have sinned, so I can't take communion. I will be eating it in an unworthy manner. Welcome to the rest of us. It's not about that. The Lord's table is open to anybody who has a living, living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It is about spiritual nourishment. It is about actually needing that food for the journey going forward. So when you're sinning or you've sinned, you forget about that because that's, that's what the communion is about. It's about what Jesus did on the cross to cancel that. You might have to say, oh dear, yeah, I've remembered something. Lord, forgive me. But you still come and have communion, Yes. What is here about examining yourself is don't forget in a particular context at a particular time. The rich were disgracing the poor. They were not honoring them. If you're not honoring a fellow brother or sister, you've got a really bad attitude towards them. And you know you have because God's pointing it out to you time in, time out. That is dishonoring and not examining yourself. That is eating the bread and the body of Jesus Christ in an unworthy manner. So this examining yourself is not about you searching out every little nook and cranny of anything you've ever done wrong. And I bet you're like me, if you sat there long enough, you would find something that you've done wrong, probably in the last five minutes. A bad thought you've already had in the last half an hour, like, when's this sermon going to be over? Can I go home, please? Wimbledon's on at two o'clock. Oh, sorry, is that just me? I want to say, come on, Murray, but I can't. So, come on, Federer. I was so upset. Anyway, you have no idea how upset I was. Murray didn't get (sighs) 
when you examine yourself, you will find everything wrong. This is not just about examining yourself on your own. This is you examining yourself, being open to God's spirit, talking to you, not in a condemnationary way, but allowing him to say to you, do you know, this is an area that you need to acknowledge that you have a problem. And you need to work on it with me. You have a problem with this person or the way that you're treating people in this way. Come. Acknowledge you've got the problem, but still come and take the bread and the wine. Do you see the difference? Anybody who's particularly guilty disposition will spend their entire life finding some reason why they can't come and take this bread. This is not what it's about. You're not meant to feel condemned coming here, but you are meant to think about the other in the room. So verse 30, what's going on in Corinth is, is that's why many of you are weak, sick, and some have died. Some people take that verse and mean that when you're sick, it means there's some sin in your life. You have sinned, that's why you're ill. That's the phrase I'm looking for. And it better be polite. What a load of baloney! We get sick. Because we live in a fallen world. Amen. Yeah, I don't want us to live in, but it is. We live in a fallen world. That's why you get sick. It's not because you've sinned. I think sometimes if we've got a really hidden sin that we know and we're not letting out, I think we get sick because we spend half our life worrying about keeping it hidden. Does it make the sin? You make yourself sick. Where if you actually admitted it to people, or admitted it to God, and then admitted it to other people, it's amazing how released you'll feel. The worry would go, because eventually you'll unpack it and you'll feel better. But here, what appeared that some clearly were being sick because they weren't getting able. To. It's the ones that weren't eating; they were becoming ill. Remember, if you can remember, I told you there was probably a famine going on. There was some economic issues going on. Not everybody was eating well. So actually, that statement is not just about eating drink, judgment on yourself. He's saying the reason there are weak and sick people is because of what you, the rich people, are doing by eating and gorging. It's not necessary. God does use weak sickness sometimes to get our attention. Sometimes he allows something to happen to us because he wants to teach us something and allow us to grow with him. Does that make sense? It's not he sends the sickness. In his sovereignty, he allows it to happen. I spent seven years with rheumatoid arthritis. My whole body was racked from it from top to bottom. Do you know, it's probably some of my best times with God ever. And I did wonder, what have I done wrong? Nothing. It's part of a fallen world. So Paul is saying, but if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. If you eat this in an unworthy manner, you're actually raining judgment on yourself. If you have got something, you're doing something seriously wrong and you know you are against somebody else within the body of Christ, and you eat this bread in an unworthy manner, you'll eat what is meant to be a mercy place, a grace place, is actually becoming a judgment place for you. But he's saying, yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. When God points something out to you, it's not to condemn you. It's to remember what I said about a loving father wants to discipline you for why? Because he loves you. He wants the very best for you. So when he points something out to you and we say, oh, God's got judgment on me, it's not. It's to, it's a loving father's discipline to point something out. Say, come on, let's get rid of that bad attitude. Let's get rid of that wrong thing you're doing. Come on, work on it with me. Admit it. Let me help you.
Because it's not about you, it's about who's in the room with you. And God wants to discipline us because he doesn't want us to be condemned along with the world. Because this world is up for condemnation, isn't it? The world's already been judged. Whether we like it or not, it has been. God doesn't want us to fall into the judgment, the condemnationary judgment along the way, does he? Does he? No. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. And I like this bit. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. Oh, is that time? Yeah. Wait for each other. Think about the other in the room. And I do like that bit with Paul. He wasn't clarifying everything. I will wait until I see you face to face to talk about the other matters. Now, was he talking to the whole of the church? Or was he going to talk about certain individual members who he's heard other things about? Maybe he wants to hear the other side of the story first before he makes other judgment calls. We do need to listen to both sides of a story before we make a judgment call on the situation. Don't we? You know, you read the papers and you go, oh, that's terrible. You've not heard the whole story. You've heard the papers bent on the story. If you hear somebody else in the church moaning about somebody else, you've not heard the whole story. I believe that Paul, when he said that, was, was going to pick up certain individual members, take them to one side, take them into his office and say, let's have a chat. Because I don't want to embarrass you. Because if I can point out a fault in you and you redeem yourself through that, you repent of it and move on with that, fantastic. The rest of the church don't need to know you can be restored without embarrassment. I think that's part and parcel of that. So when I phone you this week... I'm kidding. I've entitled this sermon, Love My Body. That's us. So when you read those uncomfortable passages either side, recognize it's about loving the body, the church. It's not about every little thing that you've done wrong and you're dishonoring Christ. It's about loving the body. It's loving the other in the room. And if you can't do that, and it doesn't mean you have to be bested buds, but we are called to love each other. And you show that by your actions and by your love and about the fact you care about the other rather than you. Let's pray. Father, recognizing that we, we do communion, as we call it. We eat of the Lord's Supper virtually every other week. And Lord, for some of us, we find it a time of feeling really condemned. And it's been too long self-examining and not allowing you to examine us. Where your grace is much more abounding than our own grace upon ourselves. Lord, I want to pray that, uh, that as we, those of us who feel like that, we come to this table knowing that grace is abounding. But Lord, for some of us who, who may, may or may not be in this room, but Lord, sometimes struggle with others and being honoring and loving to others in the body. Lord, I ask that you will help them come to a point where they can be honoring and loving to others in the body. I pray that for the church worldwide. In the name of Jesus, amen.
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.